Um, John's going to be a hard act to follow. I've got to say, I did not fly here from Egypt. I flew here from exotic San Francisco. Well, we don't have ISIS on vacation, but we do have venture capitalists. So uh, there's that. Um, like Ryan said, I'm working at Automatic on the WordPress.com API. And is everyone really sick of hearing the word API by now at this point in the conference? Because I'm going to talk a little bit more about APIs. That was a trick question because we're developers and we love APIs, which is good because we have two right now for WordPress. Um, so before, I have, some, I have some code to share, some practical applications. Uh, but before getting into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the state of the WordPress API world. Because this is what I, everyone asks, why are there two APIs? Uh, so let me explain. Well, it's too much. Let me sum up. Uh, a little bit of history. WordPress.com has had an API since uh, about 2012. And it's in production. We use it very heavily at .com. Um, for the dashboard, for a lot of our mobile apps. Uh, and basically, we have an advantage um, at Automatic, which is that we can have a very uh, kind of agile development cycle and experiment with some WordPress things without being tied to the way that Core and the community puts things together. Um, and so we have these exciting projects that sometimes uh, Sometimes it turns out to be really cool, and sometimes we kind of go off in directions and then decide that it's not the right thing to do. Um, but we've had this API that we've been building on top of, um, using internally, and there's quite a few people who are uh, building apps for it now as well. So the WP API project, um, the feature plugin that Ryan McHugh talked about, uh, started, I think, in 2013. And it's slated to become part of Core, so it will ship with WordPress. Um, kind of write down, okay, that, that does make sense. Um, so a little feature comparison of the two APIs. So WP API is for self-hosted sites only, and the .com API is for WordPress.com sites and self-hosted sites via Jetpack. WP API runs on your own servers, and we run the inf infrastructure for the .com API. Um, the plugin is completely open source and it's extensible. Ours is, some of it's open source. It ships with Jetpack, so if you wanted to look at it, you could. Um, and it gives you access to .com only features. So for example, stats, uh, reader, following blogs, a lot of the stuff that we do on the WordPress.com dashboard. The WP API is OAuth 1 authentication, which I just learned this from Ryan's talk, is because uh, it requires SSL to do OAuth 2. Um, but for WordPress.com, we do OAuth2 authentication. And they're both actively developed right now, uh, which is a question that people ask me. is like, oh, which API is the, the one people are working on? We're, everybody's working on both of them. So this is the future of the APIs. I love this picture. This is from Matt's State of the Word talk last year, API convergence. Um, but it's not going to be any time in the immediate future. I, I can tell you that right now. I think what's going to happen is that once WP API does get pushed out into core, um, we're going to start consolidating the endpoints. And what we might do is migrate the WordPress.com API to sort of be uh, a bunch of custom extensions onto the core API. But uh, I can say that we're not going to break backwards compatibility. Um, There, there probably will still be two APIs for the, for the immediate future, just because they kind of complement each other. And they solve slightly, a slightly different set of problems. So I hope that helped, and it didn't muddy the waters anymore. Um, so let's say you want to build an app on the WordPress.com API. I have a single page d3.js example that I wrote at the TeamIO meetup in Portland a couple of weeks ago. So this is about the simplest thing. I tried to come up with something very simple. Um, this is basically what it does. It displays 
an OAuth, and we do have internet, good, displays an OAuth dialog, and then you can connect it to your blog, and it's gonna pull your visitors and views and just graph them using D3. And this is all, this is how much code this is. I think it's about less, it's less than 100 lines if you don't count all the CSS. So this is the basic idea. We have to authenticate the user because we want to use an endpoint um, that's not publicly accessible. And then we're going to make a query against the stats endpoint. And when we get the results back, just ask D3 to put them in a graph for us. So this is step one. Um, those of you who've used OAuth 2 before, this makes some kind of sense. It is a standard, it's kind of a weird one. And so if, I think the people who come to it for the first time are like, why are we doing all this back and forth thing? Um, but it's basically just a way for an application to authenticate to WordPress.com um, without having to store usernames and passwords. So we're going to display this connect with WordPress.com button. Uh, it's, it's just a link that goes to the authorized endpoint. So this is the components of that link. Um, notice that the OAuth 2 endpoints are not versioned. There's just the one version of them. We're requesting a token in response. Uh, the other thing you can get is a code, which is if you're a server-side application and you want to store user credentials and you can keep that secret, then you can request a code. Um, we're going to use token because we're using something called implicit authentication, which basically means that you can whitelist a URL and uh, you don't have to store or pass a client secret, which for JavaScript applications, you can't, uh, you can't protect that secret. The client ID and the redirect URI come from your application settings on developer.wordpress.com. Uh, so you need to create an app here, basically just to mediate between your code and our API. And when you do that, we'll give you a client ID and a client secret. So the redirect URL, for this, for our purposes here, we're just using the same app. We're just gonna redirect back to the homepage. Um, it, could be any, it could be a different page on your site. The idea here is that this redirect URL needs to uh, process the token that you're going to receive when the authentication succeeds. Uh, it also should handle the error if a, if a user denies the authentication. Um, so this last one, the JavaScript origins, is what I was referring to when I said implicit authentication. This is basically just a whitelist where you can say these URLs are trusted. So if you get a request from them, it's OK to redirect back without having a client secret. Um, so the user is going to click on that link, and then they see our, our OAuth prompt. They get to choose which site to connect to. You can also, there's options where you can request access to, to all sites or specify one in that link. Um, but for us, we're just going to pick a site and approve it. And what happens is that once the API authenticates, it'll redirect back to that redirect URL. Uh, and you see it adds an access token on the end, which is just a string of gibberish, and a little bit of metadata about the token that you've received. So what you do with that is store it and then use it um, for any future requests to the API. This is just vanilla JavaScript uh, to extract the token and the site ID back from the URL. So now that we know how to authenticate, we're ready to make a query. And we're going to use the stats endpoint, which I'm going to briefly shout out to our API documentation. So if you pull that up, you can kind of poke around and see you know, what's available depending on what you want to do. You can interact with posts. You can interact with sites. So we're saying, OK, we want to we want to see a site's activity. So we can pull up the stats endpoint. You notice it tells us we want to interact with it via get as opposed to post because we're not providing any data to be changed. 
It gives you the base URL, and it says that it does require authentication, which there, basically all, all of the information that's available publicly on a WordPress site, um, you can access via the API without passing an authentication token. And this, this also tells us what we need to pass in. So in this case, it's the site's ID or the domain. The way that the WordPress.com API works is that you can either pass in the numeric site ID or just the domain name where it's running. Um, and there's a bunch of optional parameters that um, I'm not going to get into. And then it, it tells you exactly what it, uh, what it returns and what errors might happen, as well as having some code examples. So that's a really good resource, especially if you're not sure exactly which endpoints you need yet. Um, so so that's, that's our stats endpoint. So now we know how to build the query, including the site ID. And we need to pass the token that we've saved uh, as, as an authorization header. So this is just using d3.json, which if you've used jQuery, this is a very similar style where it's doing an AJAX request and you pass it a URL um, and a, a callback function. So then when the URL returns some data, it's gonna call that function and you can then decide how to act on what you've received. So this is just for me inspecting the console after doing this. Um, whatever language you use, there's different ways of constructing this header. But basically, you just want to add it to your HTTP headers for any future requests. And it's just saying, I'm authorized on behalf of this particular user to interact with this particular site. So here's the second pro tip, which is the dev console, uh, developer.wordpress.com slash docs slash API slash console, which is really cool. I love this thing. I use this all the time. Um, this is a site that you can go to and log into it and interact with the public API. Um, so I can put in, this is just getting the site information for developer.wordpress.com. And this will show you, you know, things you can add to the query. You can construct it. It gives you the documentation embedded. Um, and then it gives you a nice view of everything that'll get returned. So this is really, really useful when you're trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen from an endpoint so that you can figure out how to process it. So here's what our stats endpoint is going to return. Visitors today. See if we can bump that number higher, huh? Um, so now that we know that, and this is, this is just, this is a great debugging tool. Um, so step three is that the data comes back, it's gonna call our callback function, and then we can just graph it. This uses, um, it's actually C3, which is a really, really nice library that abstracts a lot of the D3 graphing um, setup for you. So this just calls C3.generate. Uh, you notice the, the first part of this is actually the same code as before. It's just I've added the, the meat of the callback function um, and just passes the data in. In real life, I had to massage the data a little bit um, and request some particular sorts of axes from D3. But this is what you end up with, and it'll just put it all on this nice, uh, on this nice graph view. So that's what I have. Um, I know I kind of burned through that pretty quickly. So feel free to check out the code. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Come ask me questions. Um, I would love to hear what makes sense and what doesn't, and um, you know what the what the pain points are with the API as we as we move toward uh, what what John said. It was I wish I had that graph to put in my slides as well because I think that. Once we're, we move into an API-based future, it's going to be WordPress as a platform all the way, and you're going to see just an explosion in what you can do with the platform. So thanks.